A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Glad you've joined us on the program. We've got a busy show for you today. Happy Veterans Day to all of those who have served in our nation's military. Coming up here in a couple of minutes, we're going to be talking with Ryan Weaver. He's got a uh, brand new song out uh, for Veterans Day. Let's talk about heroes. You're going to see that uh, music video. You're going to hear from Ryan himself. And you're going to hear just how politicized supporting our veterans and supporting the members of our military and law enforcement has become apparently to uh, some of the... uh, big tech companies out there. We're going to get to that story in just a moment or two. Uh, Before we do, though, I I, I want to take a minute because I've been writing about the Kyle Rittenhouse trial at Bering Arms throughout the week, and I appreciate uh, those folks who are watching. Had a uh, a VIP story uh, last night about Rittenhouse on the uh, uh, on the stand in his own defense. Uh, and I would remind you that we've got a special going on right now. Uh, you can become a VIP member of Bearing Arms. Just go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS and you'll get 40% off of your membership. You can also become a VIP gold member. That's going to get you access to uh, basically all of the VIP content throughout the Town Hall Media family of websites. So that's Bearing Arms, Red State, townhall.com, PJ Media, Hot Air, Twitchy. Uh, you're going to get live uh, uh, chats. I uh, do one every Wednesday with Hot Air's Ed Morrissey. I was on last night with uh, Larry O'Connor and uh, Chris Gaul. I think I'll be joining Stephen Cruiser and Vodka Pundit on Thursday for 5 o'clock somewhere. So there's all kinds of great content that you get when you become a VIP or a VIP Gold member. And again, we've got a great deal going on right now. 40% off if you use the promo code GUNRIGHTS. Just go to barryandarms.com slash subscribe. But so while well, I've been talking about the Rittenhouse or writing about the Rittenhouse trial at Barry and Arms, I haven't had a chance to talk much about it during the show this week. Now, the trial is taking place. It's continuing on today. Uh, one of the uh, first uh, witnesses called by the defense today, a, a use of force expert. Uh, and things are not going well for the prosecution. I mean, even with Rittenhouse going on the stand on Wednesday, which I don't think was particularly helpful to the defense, I, I, I don't think it was particularly helpful to the prosecution either, uh, in large part because they've got such a weak case. I mean, when even the state's witnesses are saying, yeah, I was pointing a gun at Kyle Rittenhouse when I got shot. I, I mean, that tends to undercut the idea that uh, Kyle Rittenhouse was uh, acting as the aggressor. When you've had eyewitness, uh, 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 eyewitnesses and you got video testimony showing Kyle Rittenhouse being chased uh, by a Joseph Rosenbaum, uh, who then lunges for his gun and is shot at very close range. I, I just don't believe that the prosecution has uh, proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Kyle Rittenhouse was not acting in self-defense, which is the bar that the prosecution must, re- uh, must reach. And it seems to me like there are some folks on the left who are starting to come to the same conclusion, although they are certainly not happy about it. Take a look at this headline from the Washington Post. Kyle Rittenhouse's story is a tragedy. The right thinks it's a triumph. Well, you know, listen, <laughs> you got a you got an 18 year old who's on trial for murder and attempted murder who could spend the rest of his life in prison. And you've got a Washington Post columnist, uh, Paul Waldman, who seems willing to acknowledge that Kyle Rittenhouse was acting in self-defense. But he is not willing to go so far as to say that uh it would be okay to feel good about not sending somebody to prison when they didn't commit murder. Yeah, this is such a one-sided story by Waldman. And by the way, it's the Washington Post. So what else do you expect? But it is worth uh, uh, talking about just a little bit. Waldman starts out by saying, here's a quick review of the undisputed facts in this case. As protest group Kenosha in the wake of the police shooting of Jacob Blake last August, Rittenhouse, then 17, took his illegally obtained AR-15 and traveled to the city from his home in Illinois. In the midst of the chaotic events, he shot... Joseph Rosenbaum, Anthony Huber, and Gage Grosskreutz. Rosenbaum and Huber died while Grosskreutz survived. Um, Actually, that's a disputed... I'll dispute what Waldman says. Because Kyle Rittenhouse did not take a rifle from Illinois to Wisconsin. He he, uh, took a rifle that was uh, purchased by Dominic Black uh, with Rittenhouse's money. Now, was that a straw purchase? Rittenhouse hasn't been charged with a straw purchase. But that rifle was actually in Wisconsin, never left Illinois until after Kyle Rittenhouse traveled back home 
after the chaotic events of August 25th. So <laughs> I guess borrowing a page from the prosecution, uh, the Washington Post has some uh, falsehoods in the supposedly undisputed facts of this case. Waldman goes on to say Rittenhouse took the stand on Tuesday in his trial to argue that he feared for his life all three times and killed only in self-defense. There's a good chance that he'll prevail, writes Waldman. There's no question that the confrontations were angry, especially after a crowd saw him kill Rosenbaum and pursued him. And while I was afraid may not be quite the get-out-of-jail-free card for civilians that it is for police officers, writes Waldman, it carries a lot of weight in both the law and the minds of juries. Which is probably about as close as you're going to get to somebody on the left saying, yeah, you know what, um... I don't think the prosecution has proved that Kyle Rittenhouse wasn't acting in self-defense. Waldman goes on to write, I'm not a conservative, but if I was, I would hope my thoughts about Kyle Rittenhouse would run something like this. The violence that occurred in Kenosha was unacceptable, but that doesn't justify vigilantism. Rittenhouse was a dumb kid pumped up by the fantasy of saving the day with his gun, but he didn't go there intending to murder anyone. He should be acquitted because he acted in self-defense, but we shouldn't forget that two people are dead, which is a terrible tragedy. Waldman says, that's not my opinion. But I do think it's about the most generous gloss you can honestly put on those events. Unfortunately, he writes, it's not how conservatives approach the story. From the moment that Rittenhouse killed Rosenbaum and Huber, he has been embraced by the right as a hero. Now, Wallman doesn't say anything about how the left viewed Kyle Rittenhouse. From, uh, let's say, August 26, 2022 today. It's all about how the right has portrayed Kyle Rittenhouse as a hero, right? He says uh, the Trump administration immediately distributed talking points to federal law enforcement officials to use if asked about Rittenhouse, in which they were instructed to say that he, quote, took his rifle to the scene of the riot and to help defend small business owners. Uh, Waldman doesn't say anything about the campaign ad that Joe Biden cut as a candidate, uh, accusing Kyle Rittenhouse of being a white supremacist, flashing his photo on the screen as he talked about the rise of white supremacy. The, the left immediately, if, look, if the right immediately declared Kyle Rittenhouse to be a hero, then the left immediately declared him to be a villain. And if Paul Waldman of the Washington Post is going to write about how the uh, right immediately lionized Kyle Rittenhouse, then why the hell won't he even acknowledge that the left demonized him in those same instances? Well, I, I'm guessing, I don't know, I've never met Paul Waldman, but I'm guessing it's because the Washington Post isn't interested in covering this story fairly, not even in its opinion columns. And I, I'm guessing that Paul Waldman uh, isn't willing to put away his opinions and his partisanship is instead trying to score cheap political points by making it seem like the left, you know, uh, uh, plays Kyle Rittenhouse on a pedestal, or excuse me, the right plays Kyle Rittenhouse on a pedestal, while the left just ignored him completely. Which is, this is family friendly, so I can't say what I want to say, let's just go with bull feathers. Now, Waldman uh, concludes his piece by saying, conservatives quickly raised much of the $2 million for his bail. After his release, Rittenhouse went to a bar wearing a t-shirt that read, free as mm, where he posed for pictures flashing a white power sign and was serenaded with the anthem of the Proud Boys, the violent, radical right-wing group, which uh, I don't know about the white supremacy sign, the free as hmm t-shirt. Uh, yeah, that was there. Uh, the Proud Boys apparently showed up, but it didn't seem like Rittenhouse invited him there. Was it ill-advised to wear a free as hmm t-shirt? I mean, maybe. But again, he's 18 years old. I, 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 I don't know. I'm not willing to tar him as a, uh, a villain based on a T-shirt that he wore. And you know what? After being in jail on $2 million bond, when you acted in self-defense, or at least you believed that you acted in self-defense, I think the jury's going to say you acted in self-defense. Would you not feel free as bleep when you were finally released awaiting trial? I don't know. It just seems to me like uh, Paul Waldman's going to be far more inclined to give the benefit of the doubt to uh, any criminal defendant who reliably votes Democrat, who who cannot uh, uh, be seen in any way, shape, or form as being the poster boy for conservatives. So I, I think Paul Waldman's uh, um, it's not just that his bias is on display. I get it. I have my bias. But I've also been willing to watch the Rittenhouse trial with an open mind. Just as I've watched the trial of Gregory and Travis McMichael and uh, William Roddy Bryan down in Georgia with an open mind. And I have learned things during the Rittenhouse trial that I did not know beforehand. We have seen videos we haven't seen before. 
We have heard from eyewitnesses we haven't heard from before. It's just that none of that new information has changed the fact that Kyle Rittenhouse was running away when he was pursued by uh, Joseph Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum uh, was within just a matter of feet, may have even been touching his gun when he was shot. Uh, Kyle Rittenhouse then started heading towards the police and was attacked first by some random guy as Kyle Rittenhouse stumbled to the ground. Some unknown person tried to kick him in the face. Rittenhouse says he actually did make contact with him. Then Anthony Huber comes up, hits Kyle in the head with a skateboard. Rittenhouse then fires in self-defense. Gage Grosskreitz then comes running up. And again, all of this is in a matter of seconds. So it's not like, you know, and then two minutes later, this happened. No, I mean, it's all bam, 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 bam. Gage Grosskreitz comes up, gun in hand, puts his hands up, and admitted on the witness stand that Kyle Rittenhouse didn't shoot him when he had his hands up. It wasn't until his hands lowered. Grosskreitz says he inadvertently or, or, or unintentionally pointed his gun at Rittenhouse, but that is when Rittenhouse fired. Now, again, you may not think that Kyle Rittenhouse was acting in self-defense, but having watched most of this trial, I can tell you from what I've seen, the prosecution has not proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Kyle Rittenhouse was not. And, and that's, again, my opinion, and it does have its own bias. I'm willing to acknowledge it. Unlike Paul Waldman, which I guess is why I'll never work for the Washington Post. Uh, anyway, I just I, I had to get that out of the way. The uh, trial is most likely going to conclude early next week. We will uh, keep you covered uh, on all of the uh, important details. But um, yeah, it's going to be ugly. It's going to be so ugly. On the part of the media, on the part of the left, uh, if Rittenhouse is acquitted as... I believe, based on the information that's been provided so far during this trial, uh, as he should be. All right. So that is topic A. We're going to set that aside now. Now we're going to talk about uh, what's going on with Veterans Day. And as I mentioned, we uh, were able to sit down and talk with Ryan Weaver, country music artist, veteran himself, uh, all around good guy, and someone who has a, a very special message and a very special song uh, for this Veterans Day. It's called Let's Talk About Heroes. We're going to talk with Ryan first, then you're going to uh, hear and see that video itself. Take a look and a listen. Hey, Ryan, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Happy Veterans Day to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and let's talk about this uh, new song, Let's Talk About Heroes. Uh, obviously, a, a great time for this uh, song to be released, but was there a was there a special significance behind this story or behind this song? What, what, what made you... Did it come to you? Did you sit down and say, I want to write a song about these heroes? How did this happen? Well, uh, I've done a few things in my past. I toured with the professional bull riders, honoring our fallen law enforcement, first responders and military across the nation. Did every arena from T-Mobile Arena in Las Vegas to Madison Square Garden, AT&T Stadium in, in Texas, you name it, 24 arenas and three internationally. And, and, you know, with my almost 21 years of active duty service and being a member of a two-time Gold Star family, uh, honoring our heroes, honoring my brothers and sisters in arms, uh, and standing side by side with our law enforcement, first responders, um, and frontline workers in the medical fields. It's it's kind of been something I've, I've done. It's just, it's kind of inherent in continuing to serve by doing that as a country music artist. But we had the idea, I, I wanted to I was looking back at the last couple of years, and our heroes have been vilified. They've been treated like crap they've been demonized um and now i'm seeing getting messages daily from military service members who are have 18 19 years of active duty service multiple deployments to combat god knows how many uh injuries from from combat you name it and they're being forced out with these vaccine mandates um prior and they're being threatened to lose all of their benefits and everything that they've earned over the over the time and it was important to me to write something. Wrote it, I co-wrote this with Dave Bray, who's a Navy veteran. He's got a song called Last Call. Um, he's dealt more with the law enforcement side, and I've dealt more with the military side. It's interesting that since um, we've written this song, I've been uh, uh, attending a lot of speaking engagements and performances for 
folks like the Wounded Blue who are law enforcement. But um, we got we collaborated on this with my friend Craig Wilson. He co-wrote Burn, my single Burn. I don't know if you've seen that with the Benghazi guys. He co-wrote that with me and several of my other songs. And I had the idea about having a military aspect to it and a hero law enforcement aspect to it and trying to combine those two. And the video that we did, um, I think, really did that. I mean, did it just right. I think we it's an extremely powerful video and a concept and storyline is genuine. It's it's real. It's a message that people need to see. And of course, we have all American superheroes like Diana Muller in it. That's right. Yeah. And we're going to, uh, you, you've given, I want to make sure that the gods of YouTube understand you've given us permission to share your video on this program, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so folks, you stay tuned because we're going to share this video uh, after we get finished talking with Ryan. I, I want to make sure we don't get any check marks. Anybody try to take us down for this stuff, but it, it was so cool. And I think our second amendment uh, supporters out there will recognize uh, uh, Diana Muller uh, in this video. Uh, with a DC project, uh, a police officer herself, uh, and somebody who understands the importance of the right to keep and bear arms, because I think Diana knows from a firsthand perspective that as much as police want to be able to respond to to every crime uh, fast enough to to prevent it from taking place, this is not possible. Uh, and and right. so, you know, the 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 frontline responders, uh, you know, the men and women who put their lives on the line every day in law enforcement. Um, you know, I've been um, I, I, it, it, it hasn't surprised me. It, it no longer surprises me. But when I first started uh, covering this issue, I was a little shocked at how supportive law enforcement is generally of the right to keep and bear arms, because that's certainly not the impression that we get from big city police chiefs or, you know, those who are uh, politically appointed. Uh, but yeah, when you actually start exactly the politicians. But when you start mm -hmm. talking to those men and women who put on a badge every day. Uh, and they take to the streets to protect and serve their community. Boy, all of a sudden you get a really different perspective, don't you? It, it seems to be that when you get to frontline anything, as opposed to the folks that get in upper up, upper level leadership positions or the politicians or whatever it is where politics get involved in it, you see completely different stories. We're, like I said, we're seeing that a lot right now with our military service members. The, the, the folks in the units, the combat units, their leadership is turning their back on them as well right now. And it's, it's really sad to see, especially on Veterans Day. Um, but you're exactly right. The, when you're watching the press briefings and you're seeing all these things happen, there are very few folks out there who are supporting our, the uh, citizens' Second Amendment right uh, to bear arms and protect themselves and their families. And Diana is obviously a huge advocate of that. Not only that, she's a great friend of mine, but when you watch the video, you're also going to see that she's an incredible actress as well. <laughs> she is indeed. And, you know, today being Veterans Day, not that I want to diminish the importance of law enforcement, but I do want to talk about those men and women who have served this country with honor uh, and distinction to, to protect our freedoms, like our right to keep and bear arms. I am not one who served. Um, many members of my family have. My dad was a World War II veteran. Uh, I have a brother who was uh, stationed in Korea when he was active duty in the Army. Uh, and and as somebody who never wore the uniform myself, I do feel like I've got an extra obligation uh, to, to, to care about and to think about what those who have served are going through. Because it's really easy in the course of our daily life to just sort of get wrapped up and you get tunnel vision about what's going on with you. Um, and yet there are, as you say, tens of thousands of these veterans, not to mention the you know hundreds of thousands of active duty military members uh, who, who I think are, you know, wearing the uniform. They're serving this country at a time in which we have a crisis here. And it's not just the, the, the covid crisis. It's not just the inflation crisis. I think, Ryan, to me, I, I feel like there's a crisis going on about what we want this country to be. What this country is all about, what's really important to us. I mean, I saw this in the elections in Virginia last week, and I think we sent a message that, you know what, we, we don't want a nation where we're always at each other's throats, where we're always looking to uh, uh, decide, OK, who's the victim and who's the oppressor? Because there's no way to find common ground uh, if, if that is our attitude, if that's how we view our fellow Americans. And by the way, our military could not function if that is how we viewed each other. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, all races, all backgrounds. My, you know, I'm a, I'm a member of a two time Gold Star family. I was deployed to combat in Iraq in 2004 when my brother Aaron was killed in action and he died with all races, uh, all backgrounds of people 
My brother Randy Billings was piloting a Black Hawk in Afghanistan uh, in 2013 when he was killed in action, and he died with all races and backgrounds. We all bleed red. We all look at it that way. And, you know, I think that just like with this video, we get to we where we connect all of the services together, where it be law enforcement, first responders and frontline workers and military, you know, with uh, a cast. Uh, I mean, we have Medal of Honor recipient Don Jenkins. We have uh, Lur or, excuse me, Jessica Lynch, who is the first female in the history of American combat to be a POW. Um, Rudy Miller, or excuse me, Rudy Pearson, I'm getting everybody's names. Himself. Rudy Pearson, he he was a tunnel rat in Vietnam. And then we have these, I mean, just the entire hero community and law enforcement and firefighters and the EMS workers there that were all available for us for this video. We see a common ground and we see, we, we see that there's a huge connection as far as, uh, you know, our here's a concern. And the point behind all that is that it's amazing how in the last couple of years, our heroes went to zero now and all of a sudden we're firing medical workers and we're firing law enforcement, we're firing uh, firefighters, we're firing all these heroes that we need out there because of these vaccine mandates that are happening and it, it none of it makes sense. Uh, I, and our military service members are all feeling this. We're all feeling this this incredible strain that you're talking about our country needs to, needs to cha uh, be changed back it needs to go back to, you know, 19, back to the greatest generation to where people were just super proud of being American and understood what it meant to sacrifice because it's being lost on people right now. And it's unfortunate. And what we were trying to do with this video with Let's Talk About Heroes was we wanted a positive message and something that wasn't political, something that stayed away from politics simply because it needs to reach people that are kind of sitting on the fence trying to figure out what's going on. I don't know how anybody's sitting on the fence when it comes to supporting what's going on right now in our country. There is only one way. It's either what's happening, which is completely anti-American or the American way. I don't know how anybody's sitting on the fence. Trying to, they're either sitting that far off to the left or they should be an American, do whatever. I mean, I, I go on and on about that, especially since the frustrations that I'm feeling today on Veterans Day when Facebook, of all things, because my plat my social media platforms are extremely important to get my music out there, Facebook uh, rejected an ad to promote Let's Talk About Heroes on Veterans Day. Rejected an ad. Okay, now I've, I've seen this video. Uh, it gave me goosebumps the first time I watched it. Uh, there's nothing objectionable. Did Facebook tell you why they uh, didn't accept your ad? They said specifically, and I will send you the the the, the picture if you want to put this on your put this on there. Said specifically that it could potentially sway the way people vote in an election. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, okay. It, it was supposedly a political ad. There were no politics in it. it all it did was honor our heroes. And they said that we, they, the ad, and then I asked for a review and it said your ad will not be posted. You can't, and when you ask for a review, there's no putting in like, hey, there are no politics in this. Like this yeah. honors our heroes. It's Veterans Day. This was put out by a veteran artist. You're telling me that I can't promote this. I mean, and the thing is a lot of folks that realize, well, you could just get off Facebook. You could get off Instagram. Facebook ads covers both of those. Those are huge platforms for an artist, a musician to get music out, to get my brands. I mean, these are my yep. partner brands with fellow veteran companies and to get those out. It's, those are huge platforms for it. And if I can't push an ad to get outside of what they're already uh, shadow banning me to, to reach, how am I going to be able to make a living? But also, how is this message going to get out there? So I just encourage everybody out there to share it. Um, the video is up on YouTube. Let's talk about heroes. It, it has 13,000 views overnight. So it's done pretty well so far. Um, share it on your social media pages and get it out there and we'll break the algorithm because uh, outside of that, uh, if I can't push an ad, the, the video is not going to go very far. I will be sharing this video on my Facebook page and I'm not much one for Facebook, but uh, I will log back in. I'll try to find my password and I will uh, log back in so I can share this video, Ryan, because that's absolutely outrageous. So yes, let's get the word out. Despite the fact that uh, big tech trying to uh, make sure the folks can't hear Ryan's message on this veterans day. And uh, Ryan, as always, man, it, it, it is so good to see um, your your activism and your passion. Uh, but it's also great to hear some some really good music. And so I got to thank you for everything you've done, everything you continue to do. And I hope we get a chance to talk again very soon. 
I appreciate you bringing me on. Uh, I can't thank you enough for giving me a platform to be able to speak to folks who don't necessarily know who I am. But I guarantee you that if anyone and anyone that loves your page watches this video, that they're going to love it too. I, you know what? I'm going to back that up. Like I said, I got goosebumps first time I watched it. Real deal. That was my true reaction. Ryan, thanks, man. Let's do this again very soon. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. Be safe. Daddy, why was Grandpa a hero? He risked his life so we could be free. What happened to Grandpa in the war? Sitting on the water, Dad told a story about Grandpa flying through the skies like a rocket, both engines flaming out. Escape from the bottom of a freedom bird falling, the only one to make it home. Till a brother with a bugle played a sad song for him, standing in the rain alone. I knelt down to ask her why Said my father was an officer Caught in the crossfire Saving another life I still remember a dark day in December When we cried to his last call An amazing grace when the bagpipes played For my daddy who gave it all Let's talk about heroes About the ones not Talk about heroes, about the ones not afraid to fight. Talk about freedom, cause someone gave their life. Let's talk about heroes, about the ones not afraid to fight. Talk about freedom, cause someone gave their life. Grandpa. You saw Grandpa? I saw Grandpa too. And he said everything's gonna be okay. Appreciate Ryan joining us on the program. Looking forward to having him back. And again, uh, yeah, you wanna have some fun with Facebook? <laughs> let's uh let's all share the link to Ryan's music video on our uh, Facebook page and 
see what the algorithms do with that. All right. Uh, listen, I tell you what, we're going to have our recidivist report. We will have our good deed of the day uh, when we return on Monday. But because of this program is getting a little bit lengthier than normal, we will leave you today with an armed citizen story. This one from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Where, uh, well, heck, I'm just going to show you the headline here because the uh, headline says it all. Woman shoots 13-year-old suspect in attempted carjacking. Now, look, I'm not celebrating this armed citizen story because I think it's a tragedy. I do. A 13-year-old out there committed an armed robbery? I mean, that's awful. I am, however, very grateful for the fact that this woman was able to protect and defend herself because it's not like she chose the age of the would-be carjackers here. Uh, the 37-year-old says it was just seconds after she parked outside of her apartment on Monday night. Two young guys walk up to her. She says, at first, the 13-year-old suspect asked to use her cell phone. Uh, he was with an older team, maybe like 16. Uh, she said, the other young man said, so you don't have a phone? And I said, no, I don't. And he pulled out his gun and said, well, give me your keys. The 13-year-old then took off with her keys, kept trying to start her car. woman said he kept his hand wrapped in a piece of, uh, piece of clothing as if, it, as if he had a gun, but never revealed one. She said, my, uh, my mind frame was to keep the other gentleman calm, so therefore he wouldn't shoot. She said it was pretty frightening. But at one point, she did see her opportunity. She pulled out her own gun. She fired multiple times. She said, it's a six round. I let the clip loose, all six in fear of my life. I am very grateful to be alive. Teens took off running. The 13-year-old was hit in the leg. Police found him a block away. He's now in juvenile custody. Police still looking for the other teen. I hope and pray that uh, this was a wake-up call for that 13-year-old. His life is too young. He does not have to go down this road. He has the opportunity to change. And I, I really hope that this is that clarifying moment in his young life where he says, okay, you know what? I can keep doing this. I'm going to end up dead. I'm going to end up in prison. Bad things are going to happen. Or maybe this is a, a, a possibility for a new start. Keep my fingers crossed. Like I said, hope and pray that that is the case. But I am very, very glad that this 37-year-old in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, was able to protect herself. You never know, unfortunately, when crime is going to strike, and you never know, unfortunately, who those criminals might be. Might be somebody you know, might be a complete stranger, might be an 80-year-old, might be a 13-year-old. But uh, remember, when you are in fear of your life, great bodily harm, you do have the right to act in self-defense, as this woman did. She's not facing any charges. The yeah, 13-year-old is. Hopefully, the uh, second suspect taken into custody will give you any details as it become available. But uh, again, I'm very, very grateful. I, I hate to see that the story happened, but I'm grateful that uh, at least the intended victim is alive and well. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program today. We will be back on Monday, but we'll be, uh, of course, filling up the website, bearingarms.com, on Friday throughout the week with all of the latest Second Amendment news and information that you need to know about. So make sure that uh, you visit when you're spending your time online, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And uh, don't forget again, check out our options and our offers for uh, VIP subscriptions right now. It's a great way to show your support for the work we do here, and we like to give back with Again, exclusive commentary, news stories, analysis you won't find anywhere else. Just go to bearingarms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS to get 40% off of your VIP membership. And let me thank you in advance for your support. Have a great weekend. We'll see you soon. Until then, be well, be safe, and be free.